What's up, Rob? It's so good to have you on the show. It's it's really it's really my pleasure and honor to be here, Justin. Thank you for taking the time. This is so fun. Well, you know, you and I got a chance to meet through you know an investment community that we're part of, um, where you know there's there's all kinds of incredible people, very smart, very successful um, in all walks of life, and. Uh, it, it has been fun getting to know you and all the cool things you're up to. You're a world traveler. You're, you know, doing all kinds of crazy expeditions. And um, it, your life story is just so fun. And I'm excited to get into it today. Well, thank you. It's an honor to be here again. Um, thank you. So I, I'm curious for you. You're a guy that has had a lot of success um, in the way that most people would would define success. Uh you grew up in Canada, you moved to the US, you moved outside the US. Um, you've been, you know, you're, you're very international. Uh, I'm curious kind of what kind of created that uh, desire in you to start traveling to start living abroad to get comfortable living outside of your home country, because I think that's a yeah. hard leap for a lot of people. Well, thank you for asking. Um, I really do believe in life planning, Justin, um, and it started for me uh, very, very young um, when I was 16, where uh, to be really honest and open and vulnerable with you, I was living in a very, very difficult set of circumstances, circumstances really dark. My mother died when I was two. We had stepmothers. I've had five stepmothers, <laughs> Whoa. which which is a blessing, right? All that hardship uh, because they didn't want me. They wanted my dad's money. And I'm not, this isn't, this isn't a victim thing. This is around strength coming out of adversity for me, which was a real blessing. And I'm very thankful for it. I would do it over again, <laughs> knowing all the strength it brings. But what it taught me was when circumstances are what they are, you can choose to accept them or you can choose to see them the way that you would want to see them in, in, through a lens of what you would, what you choose um, life to be for yourself. And so out of that grew what I eventually learned uh, to call life planning, Justin. So um, I, I've done many speeches on um, life planning and, and I'm writing a book on that now. Uh, what is your Everest? Uh, life planning and living your life to the fullest. And so going back to your question, the basics on that, I suggest that all entrepreneurs and, and budding and, and, and prospective entrepreneurs and those who want to take control of their life I mean, that's the, the, the people that I'm speaking to here with this message. And, and, and that is if you want to do more or be more in your life, you can set that goal. And it's an inspiration, however inspiration comes to you. It could be, um, I'll use some different examples. A movie I saw once called Missing, where I saw these kids having a great time in uh, what turned out to be Santiago, Chile, before, of course, all the drama of the movie happened. I thought, I, I want to live in a Latin American city and learn to speak Spanish. I didn't speak a word of Spanish. And, and, that, and I put that on what I call just an open list of dreams. And I suggest everybody keep an open list of dreams. And, and I didn't know how and when that was going to happen. But flash forward, I'm sitting in St. Louis, Missouri in a boardroom and somebody says, uh, we should shut down Mexico. There's nobody decent at a high level that would want to live there. You know, our guys don't like it. It's, uh, it's, and they were derogatory about Mexico City. And I said, really, you have nobody. And how long have you been there? They said, 25 years. And I said, so you're going to throw away 25 years of legacy because nobody here understands Mexico City and the way the Mexicans want to work. I'm Canadian. I can tell you that we work differently in Toronto than in St. Louis, Missouri. So why don't you let me go and explore it for 60 days um, and I'll come back and let you know. The next morning I was at the airport in St. Louis getting on one of those old TWA flights uh, Justin, which you might recognize because I think you lived in St. Louis, and uh, yeah. yeah, and I and when I landed in Mexico, I, re, I I was given the title of president, and there was no return ticket, <clears throat> and I my my dream of living in a Latin American country came true, um, and I learned to speak Spanish fluently enough to to live in Mexico as the only uh, non Mexican there. I joined the YPO chapter there, and, and it was it just became a, a flower that opened of lots of beautiful experiences. So back to life planning, you can, you, can, you can set goals. Any one of us can set goals, not knowing how they're going to manifest. And, and, and my book will teach seven different types of life planning that'll tie back to the seven summits. But that's one example of, uh, that ties back to international. But I would encourage everyone here to do life planning and, and live their life to the fullest, Justin. 
Oh, I love it. And by the way, I've got to tell you, I think that's one of the most important things that you do. Uh, since 2006, I've had an open dreams list, and it has been revolutionary for me. It's been re revolutionary for my family, for my wife. I mean, it's, it's so powerful when you also can start creating some of your quarterly, like for us, our quarterly meetups, our quarterly overnights, where we check in. How are you doing on your dreams? Because right. <laughs> it's inspiring when you're, you know, checking off like lifelong dreams. It's it's motivating and fun, and you know, just it creates a lot of purpose. So it does. Uh, I love that you teach that, and I love that you share that. So. When did your entrepreneurial journey begin? Because you have so many businesses. Mm -hmm. um, you have started companies. You've mm -hmm. bought companies. You've sold companies. You've invested mm -hmm. in a lot of companies. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd love to hear kind of where that began. Sure. Um, well, again, adversity creates strength, right? And so, and so one of the questions, by the way, that I'd love input from anyone on is how you create adversity for your children you love so much. Uh, because they need adversity in their lives to uh, to create strength in the future. Um, when um, my I was going to university, um, I in in high school I started uh, because I didn't have an allowance or money. I started selling things that I that well way back in grade school actually. We had these lollipops that weren't available in our, our grade school and we had bicycles. We'd ride, it would take us, I don't know, an hour and a half on Saturdays, maybe two hours. Trevor Burns, my friend and I would ride to another community, buy all these lollipops that were five cents each and come back. And we would compete for the highest price we could get for the lollipop because we were creating, you know, our spending money. And Trevor won, he sold one for $5, right? A five cent lollipop for $5. So we learned there was lots of margin uh, there in bringing unique products to a different market. But um, later in life, uh, on a more serious note, I mean, I did start BNF Seasonal Services when I was 12 with Trevor Burns and Follows, and we would cut lawns and, and, and do pool cleaning. And then we hired, we had about 75 employees um, uh, the first summer because we got so many lawn contracts. There were no lawn cutting companies then. There was no first service then. Um, and we, we would hire them for 50 cents an hour. Um, we'd get 10 to $20 per lawn. And, you know, that was an entrepreneurial business until we made a mistake once and learned from that mistake. We, uh, we pulled a pool cover that dropped three feet of leaves into somebody's pool. And, uh, and they made us promise we'd shut our business down so they wouldn't <laughs> sue us. <laughs> but in all seriousness, when my dad uh, said to me, um, you will take over the family business. My dad had started a packaging machinery business. Um, I, for as long as I could, avoided this conversation with him because I knew I was, he said, you're the oldest son. I'm selling European packaging machinery in the United States. As Canadians, we have relationships on both sides. And you will take over the business. And I said, Dad, I, I, I can't do that. He said, no, no, you will. And I said, no, Dad, no, I'm not going to. So he threw me out of the, he said, well, you're thrown out of the family financially. And by the way, I said, fine, I'll go and make my own uh, money to pay for my own school. And he said, well, hang on, you've got a bill here. You owe me $20,000 at 18% interest. And I'm like, no, I don't. He said, well, you do. And by the way, the rent will be this much going forward, et cetera. So I went and, and got a job, got bartending jobs because I'd also started a bartending company when I was underage because I wanted to, you know, go to parties and that was a fun way to do it. So I knew how to bartend. So I started bartending and I started a business um, that, that when I was in Banff, Alberta, it was a, it was a, a wholesale produce selling business. But when they went bankrupt because they sold too much produce, which is another whole lesson, um, they, they transferred me to a marketing services firm. I opened the branch in on, in on, I, this is fun. The guy came, the suppliers called me, Justin, and said, if you, if you don't separate from that guy, because all the volume is coming from you and all the customers are in Toronto, we're going to give you full credit. His name was Bill. Then, then we're going to cut you off. I said, we well, can't. They're my friends. They said, well, then you need to separate. So I called Bill and said, I don't know quite how to say this. He said, well, let's play a game of pool for the business. I said, what? on my wow. pool table in my house, he said, sure. It was crazy. So he comes by. He's from Calgary. We play a game of pool in Toronto. And we, of course, I win. I wasn't going to lose that game. And and so the next day, I thought the name up overnight, AIM, Active Impressions and Marketing for Marketing Business. We started that so that I could pay for my school. And I paid for uh, university. When I graduated, I had to make a decision. What was I going to do? I wanted open list of dreams to go and see the world. And I thought, if I work two solid years, I'll have enough money to go and see the world. 
That business became the largest. It, we kept growing and adding to it, growing and adding, and it became the largest independent marketing services firm in Canada. When free trade opened up, there's a huge lesson here. I ended up selling it to Merit Inc. out of St. Louis, Missouri to become part of a global operation. But that is a whole other story. Um, but that's the entrepreneurship came from having to pay the bills. <laughs> Wow, that's incredible. And I'd love to learn more about that story. But before we get into it, because I know you had an incredible multiple on that business. But before we get into it, I think you spent um, some time um, being educated at Oxford. Isn't that right? Yes. Yeah, fortunately. Yeah. So what was that like? I don't I, I mean, I've met a ton of people. I've had a lot of people on my podcast that, you know, are from the Ivy League schools here in the U.S., um, I have not had too many people, you know, on from Oxford. Yeah, it's 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 it is a different university. It's very it's full of independence, um, and so all the the DPhil uh, PhD students, the professors, most of them um, have chairs in there, and and so it's a very independent world where you do a lot of work on your own. You're surrounded by all these resources. So my experience was. Um, being invited to a month long in 1999, uh, which was, a, which was a, a raving time for people learning about the internet because it was unproven at the time, if you can imagine that. Um, and, and they said, we're gonna pick two students from Canada. Uh, one was one of the senior executives at Nortel, and thankfully the other one was me for a month long course at Oxford. So I went to the month long course, um, and they said, present your business model. And I said, I'm not gonna do that. The Merit's business model is too proven it's worldwide it's you know three billion dollars of revenue a year 30 percent margin twenty two thousand employees i that business model is quite strict but my charity that i sold my business to start many years ago charities have trouble scaling and so i want to do this on charities how to help charities understand how they can scale because scaling a charity still to today justin is not easy and so they said well okay you can present that then and it really opened up the conversation because it wasn't competitive. I was the only one doing, you know, charity work and there were some brilliant minds there. And at the end of the course, <clears throat> they called me in, three of the professors. I said, well, I'll open with an apology. I'm sorry, I'm running a billion dollar, it was $980 million business at the time for Merits. I, I'm, I have a lot of work to do. I know I couldn't make all the dinners. I couldn't be, I apologize. I said, Rob, can you please uh, wait until we speak? This is Oxford, we speak first. I'm like, okay. <laughs> he said, we're here to offer you a PhD um, place in our PhD program. I said, sorry, what are you saying? I didn't apply. They said, well, we're the acceptance committee. You know, you took us out for dinner uh, a few times and shared things with us. We appreciate that. We know you don't know that we're the acceptance committee. We're the acceptance committee for the business school. And, um, and, we, and we're accepting your application to do a PhD program on the idea of the charity that you just spent a month on. If you could take that idea and contribute it to the world, the charity is called UltraVest, then we will accept you to our PhD. I said, I can't do it. They said, no, no, Rob, do not say no. Can we give you some advice? Not many people get this. Just be quiet, leave the room. We can go have drinks together later, but in this official room, do not say no. I said, okay. So I flew back to St. Louis. There was a direct flight then from London. I went and sat down with Bill Merritts and I said, Bill, I have to quit. I'm gonna go do a PhD. And he said, I'd love to have a PhD guy from Oxford, Rob, on the senior leadership team because I'm dying. I said, what? Whoa. He said, you think your announcement's important? I think mine's a little more important, Rob. And oh. not everybody knows about that. He was my mentor for, for 10 years. I, he, would, he would say this in mentorship. I don't know the questions. You ask the questions. And the better the question, the more time I'll spend with you. You better come up with good questions. And so I'll meet you once a month. If you don't have any good questions, it'll be a five-minute meeting. If you have really good questions, we'll go to the cabin in the woods and we'll spend the evening. So I did my best, Justin, to ask a lot of good questions. He said, I'm dying. I need you to stay. What is it that you, what is it you need? I said, well, I guess I need people to run the business while I'm at Oxford. He said, fine, open in a budget, hire the CEOs you need. And you're the chair of the international and, and go and get your PhD. And eventually I'll be announcing my, you know, my, my circumstances because it's irreversible cancer. <clears throat> so I said, Bill, what's my, what's the funeral celebration? He said, you do not come back for my funeral. And this is another whole story on polo, play a polo game in my honor. Cause I know you love that. And we did a polo game with purple and on one side, purple and green and white and 
green on the other and had a whole polo game in London uh, to, in his honor. I was afraid of horses. That's why polo is a whole other story. But at any rate, um, I stayed there for three years in the program. It was I worked full time at the same time. I got challenged because you're not allowed to work full time while you're there. Um, and I told them I, you know, I felt that would be not a smart thing to tack me on because I go to the press and say, can only rich people go to Oxford? Like, why can't a guy has to work go? You know, and they left me alone on that. Um, but there were some other issues that came up, and eventually it was a strategy issue. It's very political in uh, in in high level uh, academics and strategy. Um, as a discipline, which is what I was working on, how do CEOs, uh, just adjusting my thesis so on, how do CEOs make their decisions to give corporately for corporate philanthropy, which is only 1% of philanthropy. And so that's what my thesis was on. And when a new strategy guy came who was very serious, he said that belongs at Harvard because, because philanthropy is in the industry-specific competitive advantage um, area. We're firm-specific over here. You need to be transferred to Harvard. We'll arrange it tomorrow. And that's where you need to go. And if you don't go, we'll have to fail you on your PhD. And I'm doing you a favor. So this doesn't feel very much like a favor. You're going to oh. fail me? He said, I'm doing you a favor. You don't spend seven years. It's pass, fail, and fail. I'm telling you right now, Rob, we like you. We like what you're doing. We think it's a good contribution, but not. it won't be finished at Oxford. It has to be finished at Harvard. So that's when I started STS Capital Partners, um, which is which is my, my supervisor said, Rob, this, the work you're doing in wanting to contribute selling to strategics to these iBanking students is really the work that could help make the world a better place. Why don't you go do that? And I did. <laughs> wow, that's just incredible. So um, a, a few things, I've got a few questions because I, I kind of want to tie this together. So when you sold your company, you sold it at a crazy multiple, um, although you later found out maybe you could have sold it for more, mm -hmm. um, but you sold it to Merits and and the founder uh, of that company really became your mentor through that process, right? Yes, sir. So let, let's talk a little bit about that transaction because I think most people um, have no idea how crazy a, you know, these mergers and acquisitions qu can be, that it is just, uh, th there's all kinds of tricks of the trade. There's all kinds of things that happen mm -hmm. in the 11th hour. Mm -hmm. uh, would, would love to get your thoughts on this and just kind of learn some of the things you learned vicariously through you. Well, thank you for asking. So um, the second message I would have for everybody here um, that's it's important, I think, is you too can sell to strategics. And I want to talk about merits as a strategic for us. Um, and all the learning in the background there. Um, one of the reasons I started STS Capital Partners um, is because I couldn't find somebody, Justin, to represent me that really understood the buyers um, and, and, and who out there would see us as strategic, um, not as you know just a plug-in uh, financial multiple. Um, and so the lesson here as I tell the story is one of the important lessons is to be represented when you're going to sell by somebody who really cares about you. You're not a number to them. You're somebody that that they're going to help maximize value and, and create an extraordinary exit and isn't talking about you know, how the financial markets work and all that, but rather how in your business there are things that will matter to the buyer that you can't see matter to the buyer. And they can matter to the buyer so much that forget about EBITDA multiples or sales multiples, that they will pay, they will share some of the upside that they're creating with the, with the acquisition of your firm. And if you can come to understand that, you can create incredible valuations which we have at STS but it's not because we're brilliant it's because we're disciplined at only focusing on helping the sellers understand the value you know the Rembrandt in the attic example you know and that example is that if if your spouse came home and said hey I want to buy a house here on this street can we please go and agree on that but it's five million dollars more than all the others on the street you would say well why won't we just get it well the bathroom is beautiful you know I'm in love with it and an inspector comes in and says the house is great, but have you seen the paintings in the attic? This is unbelievable. We're going to bring Christie's in because it's signed Rembrandt. And there's more than one of them. And, and so you then go to the real estate agent and say, all in, we'll take it, right? Because you've discovered something that the seller didn't see. And that is that they had Rembrandts in the attic. What are the Rembrandts in your attic? What are the, 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 the assets, the skills, the processes, the knowledge that you're taking for granted that if they were to be integrated into a buyers that they would make so much more, you know, who can make a billion dollars owning your business, for instance. So I'm spending some time there because that's where the value is created. And in my case, in selling to merits, I had no idea. I couldn't find somebody to represent me. 
And, and, and that's one of the reasons, the main reasons I started STS Capital Partners to help people get, you'll hear this in a second, the hundred times EBITDA that Merits was prepared to pay me that I never knew about until I became part of that team and saw my own file. And so with my business, which became you know, national in Canada, operating in two languages, licensed in all the provinces, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, it was a direct plug-in for somebody coming into the country under free trade that, that happened uh, in the late um, 90s um, uh, in, uh, in, in North America. And so my advisors said, Rob, you better get down there and talk to some of the people that are doing this work. So, uh, you know, I, I, I was skiing with my dad's friends. One of them was a strategy consultant. I hired him, said, you know, would you please take me down and under, you know, because you got gray hair and I was in my late 20s um, and, and help me understand this. So, so we, I tried my best not knowing how to position with a strategic bring a strategy consultant, we went to see him. He said, this is incredible. And Bill Merritt went to, to Carlson Marketing in Minneapolis first. The situation, it turned out later, which I'll describe to you, was, was Merritt's was making, say, I mean, it's hundreds of millions. I won't get into exactly how many, um, so you can publicize this, that they were making all this money on their largest client, which back then was General Motors. They had no representation, Justin, in Canada. I could fix that, that that risk they had in one transaction. So they, they gauged the value of my business on the money they were protecting for their global General Motors business because Carlson Marketing, their arch competitor, they go toe to toe with every year at General Motors and Ford and, and, and Chrysler and all the other large spenders was getting all their intellectual property to implement in Canada because there were a thousand GM dealerships in Canada. That's what drove the value. Nothing to do with my EBITDA, nothing to do with our customers. If they could, and I didn't know this as the seller. And so I sold the business and they paid 27 times EBITDA for the business, which was fantastic. I was so thankful. I bought champagne for everybody in Burlington, Ontario, in the restaurant that uh, call it's covered, I remember, um, because I was so happy. Three years later, I ended up in St. Louis, in my office. I, I moved to St. Louis um, as my base. And I looked at my, and I asked for my file. I finally got it late at night. I looked at my file. There was a summary on the cover. These files used to be pinned. They weren't electronic and and it, it justified 100 times EBITDA for my business signed wow. by the CFO. Jim was CFO's name. And I'm like, Rob, you left 75% of the money on the table. How can we help entrepreneurs just to not leave 75% on the table and understand their value to a strategic is one of the main reasons we started STS and, and, how, and, and a huge lesson I learned from uh, the sale of that business to Merit Sink in St. Louis. Wow, that's powerful. Um, and, and it's one of those things where, like, I love that you've got a good outlook on it. You're, uh, so you lost out, mm -hmm. but you still did plenty great, right? Yes. <laughs> and uh, But okay. you, you see this upside, you see this potential. And so I love creating a business model. I mean, this is exactly what I did with Lifestyle Investor, where I just saw the market did not have what Lifestyle Investor has, but the market wanted it. Uh, most people wanted it and they knew that they wanted it, but met, but there's a large share that wanted it, but just didn't know yet that they wanted it. And, and so for you, like, that's it. You found this perfect product service market fit mm -hmm. where you could help maximize um, a sale to a strategic. And so mm -hmm. I think this would be a great time to, you know, share with, you know, our audience today. Mm -hmm. The, the different ways that you can sell because you can sell a company, mm -hmm. you know, just straight up. You can go public with a company, but like going, mm -hmm. you know, selling to a, a true strategic mm -hmm. that wants to acquire your business because there's value add, meaning they don't have to buy it. You mentioned this. They don't have to buy it based on profitability. They don't have to buy it on certain multiples of whatever metric of profitability, you know, that company measures or you measure, uh, it's truly a value add for their company, their clients, their, you know, team, whatever it might be. So I'd love for you to get into some of the specifics on, um, on those different type of acquisitions and, and all the extra ways that you can get to that 75 additional percent that mm -hmm. people can make on the exit. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. So uh, the firm started at Oxford uh, 20 years ago um, and in St. Louis and in Toronto all at the same time. And, um, and we've since grown to 34 cities around the world. And the reason I'm saying that is international is another leverage um, to sell to international strategic buyers because they're also buying 
the access to the American market if you're U.S. based or, or whatever country and they're buying access to your market. And, um, and I'm the chair of the firm now. I'm not the CEO anymore. And uh, we have over 30 partners that are all operators. But here's one of the keys, Justin, in, and I'll explain this in a second. But in order to be able to help people sell to strategics, you needed to have been a strategic buyer before. And, and all of our partners have, have been strategic buyers and have also been operators and, and, and sellers of businesses. And whoever it is that you might, as an entrepreneur, want to have represent you, you want somebody that's been an operator before, not just an iBanker um, or a broker, and has been a strategic buyer who understands the pressures and the, and the, the risk that a strategic buyer takes when they go through this process. And that will really help. So. When you go to sell a business, uh, first of all, the vast majority of businesses are private, Justin, and I'm sure you know that. They're not, although the newspapers are all full of the public information, the vast majority of businesses are private. And we kind of represent those as, as circles, if you could imagine those. Um, and the, and the, the people that come to buy them, private equity, venture capital, um, SPAC, special purpose acquisition companies, um, strategic opportunity funds, those are the people that are actively chasing you to buy your business. And normally when somebody's chasing you to buy your business, they're not your friends. They're doing it for their own interests. And they're really, as we try to teach again and again, middlemen that buy low, Justin, uh, in order to sell high to who? To strategic buyers. And if you think of those are different shapes and colors of different strategic buyers, really what you want to think about is if they're buying low from you to sell high to a strategic and sometimes another private equity guy in between, then why can't you, how do you position yourself, not with these private equity and the others that are chasing you to buy your business low, but actually take the time and, and, the, and the concentration and, and or hire advisors. I think hiring advisors is important. I didn't have one, I wish I did, um, to sell to a, a strategic. Um, you mentioned the 11th hour. I lost $5 million on the last dinner, the last dinner, Justin, because... Uh. I was I, I was paying two lawyers and I thought I don't need these lawyers anymore. They're not they're you know, they're costing a fortune. This is just a celebration dinner. I didn't understand the process and where the the points are and how far you have to stay away from the buyer, by the way. You have to keep them in love with you, but stay away from them. Um, and keep your team away from them for sure. But that's just one learning point. And I didn't realize that. I went out for dinner with them. Um, and they even though the papers were all on the boardroom table back then it was uh, hard copy signing. Um, five million dollars gone, gone because I didn't, I didn't have a good advisor on the last dinner. So remember this, please. You're a private business. You're the, you're the gem in the universe uh, for, um, for private equity and other, and other VCs and, and, and other financial buyers to invest. And they will tell you they're the only way to go. And, and there's been a huge pattern developed in the marketplaces that, that support that because that's in their interest. And these are very smart people. And this has happened over the last 20 to 30 years. It's a very, there wasn't this, this, this propensity of financial buyers way back. So it's this generation. So please remember that you as a private uh, business owner can sell to a strategic. You just have to understand how to position yourself, what the value is, what they would see as the Rembrandt, um, what, what, how to position yourself with them. Um, and I would suggest getting great representation to do that of people that understand strategic buyers. Now, the difference between a, a can I go on it, Justin? Is that okay? Yeah, please do. Um, a, a financial buyer is somebody that will will come in and use financial models. They'll look at your EBITDA. They'll look at your sales. They'll do they'll do lots of due diligence, and the due diligence is not uh, in your interest. And they will, for the most part, look at finding ways of reducing the price so that they remember on the private equity model. I won't get into it, but they keep twenty cents on every dollar they don't pay you or that they can sell for under their model. It's called a two and 20 with an 8% hurdle rate normally. I won't get into that, but that means that they're incented to not pay you a dollar because they keep 20 cents of it. That's quite an incentive. So financial buyers are trying to, to understand what they can resell to a strategic. And so they'll go and talk to the strategics, which really pollutes the environment for you. Because if you also want to sell to a strategic, they're going to say, oh no, we've got this company, there's warts on it and there's problems with it. But don't worry, we'll fix it up over the next three to five years and sell it to you. But tell us, what is it that you would really value in that? And then they create a, um, a, a, a model that they present to their committee. They usually meet on Monday mornings, uh, their, their credit committees, and they already have the exit plan. So knowing all that now, please know that you too can sell to a strategic. And the way that works 
is by, by, by stopping as early as you can, one or two or three years in advance of selling and saying, okay, what will the strategic value my business? Who are these strategics in my home country, if it's the US and in the rest of the world? Are they an adjacent business next to mine that want to come into my industry? Are they in my industry, vertically integrated in, in tension maybe? Are they, what are they? And it's different for everyone. And so then identifying who they are, we do a mind mapping you know, process uh, with clients to identify different vectors of those. And then how do I position myself to be of value to them? At STS, we can talk about it later, we have a value max process. So we actually start working with people and their coaches and their teams a couple of years before. But here's the message. Uh, just hopefully it's succinct. You too can sell to a strategic. You don't have to sell to financial buyers. The goals you have, which we can talk about in a few minutes of required outcomes, can be yours. You can make that dream come true. You can make a list of all the things that must be and you'd like, you know, must haves and like to haves, and you can eliminate buyers that won't support those. So you write your own ticket, Justin. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that. And I think it's important for you know our listeners and those watching to recognize that when you go to a typical you know investment banking firm, they're going to drum up whoever's in their list of contacts. And hopefully if they do a good job, there's going to be some sort of a bidding war. They're going to try to drive value up that way. But what you're saying is uh, that market may not be the... Um, you know, the greatest value producing market like you. So one of the things that you guys do is you go beyond this group uh, of people looking to buy companies and find these strategics and often, by the way, overseas. So th these are groups, these are companies that a lot of investment banking firms, a lot of other merger a, uh, mergers and acquisitions, M&A uh, groups aren't able to find because they're not sourcing beyond maybe their own ecosystem of of buyers and so mm -hmm. it makes sense to kind of put on the radar hey to this company who doesn't even know you're selling and and hasn't ever bought a company from us in the past we actually think there's some synergies with this company you should take a look at it even though you're in you know london and this company here is in austin texas is that right mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely uh justin absolutely and 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 i would say that 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 um that understanding the industry specialists are also conflicted uh, because they're going to be focused on the buyers and, and working with non-industry specialists who have great advisors in, in, in your industry or maybe you're the advisor in the industry and work with them to create a list of strategic buyers who your advisor is not betrothed to because they go back to them every month. You want to be careful of all the conflicts in the financial services world. There's many, many, many of them. But one of the biggest ones is these is these advisors are more interested. There was a legal suit with uh, Hewlett Packard about this. They're more interested in serving the buyer over here than they are you as the seller because they're going to do many transactions with the buyer. And there, those those are challenges that you want to avoid. And so, absolutely, um, working with a generalist that has experts in your industry that won't be married to the buyers, but will position you properly with each of the buyers, and maybe even start. A few years early getting on their radar so they tell you what they want to see justin that'll maximize value for you as the seller i love it well one of the the really neat value adds that you have i think you know when i think about like your resume and your pedigree rob is you're not only an entrepreneur by heart but you also are uh an attorney by trade right yeah. so you have this legal side of you but you also have the entrepreneurial side which is nice and you started talking a little bit about the value max strategy. I, I think that, that there'd be a lot of um, value in you sharing some of the things that you do to kind of help people along the way as they're trying to figure out, are we ready to sell? Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and what should we do? And how do we raise the capital that we may need? Because most people don't even know it's expensive just to try to sell your company. And yeah. so two different things. Yeah. Number one, if you are trying to sell your company and you're the person doing it, then it generally takes you out of operations and then the business suffers, uh, which is not a good way to do it. And then number two, to take a company public or to get things in a place where you're going to have the right strategic come in and buy at the highest multiple, at the highest value, it's going to take capital on the front end to like set it up, right? So yeah. talk through that. I will. Um, a couple of really important points you made. Uh, first of all, I don't practice law. We're not lawyers. We just focus on maximization of sell side just to make sure that's clear. 
You have as an entrepreneur um, many options when you go to sell your business. And the one thing I want to make clear is, as you mentioned, an IPO, Justin. IPO is one option, um, and, and there's other options that you can consider as well. Selling to private equity would be one, um, and, uh, and SPACs and other opportunities that would be in front of you. Really importantly, they're not mutually exclusive. So it's, what that means is, is you don't have, it's not one or the other. And so you can go to strategics and understand your valuation, whether it meets all of your goals. And if that doesn't work, then you can do an IPO if that was really what you thought you know, would be a great fit. Or you could sell to private equity. But 99, 95 to 99% of the time, we see strategics really performing for entrepreneurs. And it's a totally confidential process. If you're going out to private equity, it's not confidential. It will get back to your to your potential clients because they're doing the research and the due diligence. It might even get back to your employees. So, Justin, selling to strategics is an option that really is one that I would encourage every entrepreneur to start to prepare for early, and that's where our value max comes in. And so, committing that you're going to sell down the road when you hit a certain number, or you know, another three years I'm done, or five years I'm done, is important. So, and that's. Getting back to life planning. What is it you really want to do with your life and how does your work support that? And so many people use the $100 million. If I get to $100 million, then, then I, what, what if we look at it now and we think, well, we can probably get you to $200 million in six months or eight months. I mean, thinking about what, when you'll be ready to exit and what life will be like on the other side of that. What is your legacy work that you'll do on the other side of your transaction is really important. And so we help with that as well, by the way. But... Step one is determining kind of when would be the trigger for you to sell. Is it a point in time or a number? And then you think about, okay, well, let's say that's two or three years down the road. It's never too early to start. So you can start now then at this point in time working through the different months and quarters as they proceed towards that exit and start to think about how do I maximize value in my exit? Well, STS knows that entrepreneurs need that help. And so we're in your corner and you're selling to strategics coach in your corner along with your other coaches your, other, your others you're doing work with, we'd love to work with your coaches to help them integrate the, the work they're doing into what the strategic buyers will pay the most for. And so starting a year or two or three in advance with Value Max, that might be whatever the list is of what you need to maximize value here. And sometimes we go out with your permission, your support to talk to the strategic, say, hey, what would you guys really value in, in three years? Not a, We wouldn't name the business unless you want us to, for this type of business. And if you want us to name it, if you're open, we say, well, XYZ is going to be available in three years. And I think that's smart. And the reason is the strategic buyer, and having been one, keeps that on their radar. They actually put it in their plans. In three years, we're going to acquire this. Maybe the CEO says, wait a minute, why don't you buy that now? And then maybe they come back. We have one now. We have 20 people interested in it. And somebody was calling me on the weekend, the managing director in charge, but saying, hey, do we accept this offer? And I said, well, See if you can get 30 more percent out of them and then we'll give them 30 days to close, you know? So getting in front of those strategics is, is, is of great value. They can tell you what you can invest in along the way. We have a great example of a Polish baker uh, that was for sale, the German buyer, and the German buyer said, I don't want EBITDA. I, I won't pay for EBITDA. I'll pay for the routes you have times my top 10 pastries profits. We thought, wow. So we ran the test. If, if we took all the EBITDA and invested in more trucks and more routes, and the price would go up this much. And they're like, absolutely. And so you never know until you actually talk to the strategics what they're actually looking for, and you can build towards that. And that's what Value Max is about, whether you need capital or you need executives or you need new knowledge, even we'll contact new clients, new geographies, joint ventures. Whatever it's going to take to increase the value, we'll work alongside your coaches to support that. Uh, given the commitment you've made to sell in that period of time. That's what Value Max is about. I love it. You, you've got all the strategies, right? If someone's ready to sell now uh, and they want the highest value, if someone knows in the future they want to sell, here's how you make your company the most valuable it can be. And it's likely not even the way that you think it is. What you and I probably early in our careers thought was the best, smartest, fastest way to grow a company is actually not necessarily what str the strategics want, uh, which is fascinating. Now, uh, Rob, you've talked a lot about life planning, and you've done very well in your life on many levels. Um, you know, I, I uh, am so excited about kind of like your, your, uh, the way you split time with a home in Barbados and a home in Whistler, so you get, you know, some hot months, some beach months. <laughs> 
but uh, it, you know, with the nice pink sand, but then you also get the cold months, you get some skiing. Um, I, I would love to hear, and, and by the way, there's some strategy that you have even just with Barbados in general, because for you as a Canadian, uh, there, there's a tax haven there, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I would say that um, whatever inspires and fills your heart with, uh, with joy and, and happiness, thinking about a vision of something that you would want, whatever that is, whether it's in my case, knowing that I, I started out as a very high strong guy, I need to be in relaxing environments, to be honest, uh, Justin, to live long because you know, New York City would, would be too much for me. And so I, I created the vision of a, of a, of a living on a beach and, and, and uh, for a chunk of the time and, and we found this perfect place. When you create the vision and you, and you spend time in it, the universe will, it's the universal law of attraction, it will bring it to you, um, I believe very strongly in experience. And so, so in my case, you know, I had a rough go as a family and so one of my goals, Justin, was to create a, um, a, and, and live in a beautiful family and, and I'm very thankful we have that now. Um, and so I would say that this, I don't want this question to be about me. If you're okay with it, I'd like to turn it back to the audience here and say, if you, whatever, you know, there's an old saying, whatever you can conceive and believe you can achieve. And so I know that sounds trite, but actually it's very, very real. If you can, if you can think about and imagine and, and put yourself in the, in the feeling of, uh, have a vivid vision as Cameron Harold calls it for, for what it is that you would make your heart happy, make your heart sing either with or without the business. If, if the business that you have needs to be sold to support that, you know, you can make that happen. If you want to, if you want to blend them and have a blended life, you can make that happen. What I've learned in many, many, um, uh, events I've been to talking to many people as, as a speaker on this is that, that we go through chapters in our lives, um, Justin, I believe. And so if you're in this chapter now and it's starting to feel like you've been there and done that, then, and you're an entrepreneur and you own a business, you can sell that business and start planning for your next chapter and that will catapult you into the next uh, level of, you know, of awareness and of knowledge and of, of, of capacity because what I tell many entrepreneurs are not sure is, well, one thing to consider is if you've sold and you build the business well, you put points on the board, it attracts capital and resources in your next chapter because people know that you're, you're a success. And so back to the life planning, I think you can, whatever you believe and conceive you can achieve. I don't remember who I'm quoting there, but, um, but it could be Napoleon Hill. I can't remember, but, but really taking the time to visualize what your life can be for you and, and, and fear is the number one, um, uh, the number one constraint there. And I can go into that if you'd like, but I'll just say this, your ego and your subconscious are afraid of change. And so they're, they're happy with what they're comfortable with. So if you don't really try really hard, then you're going to stay with what you know in your life and that'll be how you pass. If you step into your fear and walk through your fear, and I can talk about that um, using an Everest analogy, then you can open up the possibilities in your life. And I'll just say one thing, which I think you know, Justin, and that is they're endless. Mm, I love it. Yeah. Endless opportunities, endless possibilities. You know, one of the things that uh, I love about you, Rob, is that you are incredibly charitable. Um, we've talked about a lot of the different organizations that uh, we support um, financially and with time and with, you know, other resources, connections, um, ideas. And um, I, we don't have uh, any more time to dig into any of the myriad of things that we can get into, but I wanted to make sure that uh, it is known to those that are tuning in here today that um, you are so passionate about helping create billions of dollars in the nonprofit space to be able to do good work in the world and to inspire and empower people. And so I just wanna thank you for that. You have inspired me in that category. Um, and I just think it's great. And I love that uh, you've got a company that, well, you have various companies that help people all the way, you know, from, uh, you know, just getting started to ready to exit. And uh, you're just a wealth of knowledge and such a resource. So I want to thank you for taking the time to be on the show. I want to thank you for your wisdom. And I want to ask you, where can our audience find out more about you uh, for those that want to enlist you for their services. Oh, thank you. Well, STS is uh, success to significance through selling to strategic. So you'll find us, uh, you can Google us on the internet. I'm Rob Follows, so Rob at STS Capital Partners. You can email me anytime. 
uh, and we will we will we have an offering for those that uh, that come through yourself, Justin, of a of a free valuation of strategic. What would a strategic pay for your firm? We're happy to do that work um, on behalf of you, um, Justin, for your for your group. So, Rob at STS Capital Partners, um, and thank you. Really do appreciate you, Justin, all you're doing to make this world a better place. Well, thank you. That, that is awesome that you're offering uh, such a value add to the lifestyle investor community. <laughs> so cool. For those of you that are entrepreneurs, I highly recommend that you take Rob up on his offer. Um, and, you know, I just have heard nothing but praise from those that have worked uh, with Rob closely and, and use his strategies uh, for the ultimate um, uh, acquisition of their company to a strategic. So uh, I, as those of you that have tuned in for a while know, I love to end every episode with a question. Uh, so this is specifically uh, a question for you, for the audience. What's one step that you can take today to move towards financial freedom and really move towards a life that you desire that's on your terms? It's not a life by default like so many live, but rather a life by design. Thanks, and we'll catch you next week.